It is an incredible privilege, isn't it, to be able to take communion together. And I know that that's um, so different to what we would love it to be. We would love to be gathered in this room together and breaking bread and taking the cup and sharing it as we uh, move forward together. And um, that's always such a, a special part of how we meet each week. And yet, um, I count it a complete privilege that even though we can't be here in this room, that we have the ability to be able to almost coordinate ourselves together to be able to take the bread, remembering the body broken of our great shepherd, and to take the cup as we remember the sacrifice that was required uh, to deal with the, the deep sin of our lives And that that was all wrapped up in our great shepherd, Jesus, as he was able to do what we could not do. And we've been able to remember that this morning. I hope it's been something that has been special um, for your family or as you sit um, maybe alone, but knowing that you are not alone and that your brothers and sisters are with you. But more importantly, your shepherd stands beside you. Uh, And so thank you for sharing in that together as a church. Uh, I want to finish up our series that we've been looking at over the last number of weeks now. We've looked at what a pastor is, and last week we focused in on who a pastor should be. And we began the whole series quite a number of weeks now, actually the very first week after the New South Wales government announced that we were going back into lockdown as we um, really just paused as a church to look at that beautiful psalm, Psalm 23, and we were able to identify and see that good shepherd, that great shepherd, the one that we look to. And, And we started to then unravel what does that mean for us as a church if we have such a great shepherd? What should it look like for those of us that are called under shepherds? How should the great shepherd set the tone, as it were, for us as a church? Um, We've looked at passages from the Old Testament. We've looked at, last week, some key passages from the New Testament, particularly the pastoral epistles, uh, to root our understanding. And what did Paul have to say? What did Peter have to say about... Um, New Testament shepherds in the local church. Now, one of those passages in particular I want to return to today um, to highlight what I think is a key distinction that we see of a type of leadership in the early church. And then I want to, towards the end of today's message, move on to some practical considerations um, that we follow here at Raymond Terrace. So here's the first question that I want you to consider this morning. And it's this. What's the deal with deacons? Okay? We, we have elders or pastors or uh, overseers or shepherds in this church, and we have done for as long as this church has existed. Um, but there's a key passage that we read from last week in 1 Timothy chapter 3. So if you have your Bibles, please go and open it up to 1 Timothy chapter 3. I want to reread one of the key passages that we read last week, which is specifically addressed to the subject of elders or pastors. But I finished in verse 7. That passage continues, and we're going to read all of that today. I'm going to read from the Christian Standard Bible. Just follow along in whatever version uh, you have and on hand. I hope that maybe you're able to read it in your physical Bible if you're looking at your device uh, for this YouTube. But 1 Timothy chapter 3, read along with me from verse 1, and we're going to read all the way down to verse 13. It says this, This saying is trustworthy. If anyone aspires to be an overseer, he desires a noble task. An overseer, therefore, must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, self-controlled, sensible, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not an excessive drinker, not a bully, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not greedy. He must manage his own household competently and have his children under control with all dignity. 
If anyone does not know how to manage his own household, how will he take care of God's church? He must not be a new convert, or he might become conceited and incur the same condemnation as the devil. Furthermore, he must have a good reputation among outsiders so that he does not fall into disgrace and the devil's trap. That's where we stopped last week, but I want to continue in verse 8. Deacons, likewise, should be worthy of respect, not hypocritical, not drinking a lot of wine, not greedy for money, holding the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience. They must also be tested first. If they prove blameless, then they can serve as deacons. Wives, too, must be worthy of respect, not slanderers, self-controlled, faithful in everything. Deacons are to be husbands of one wife, managing their children and their own households competently. For those who have served well as deacons acquire a good standing for themselves and great boldness in the faith that is in Christ Jesus. This is God's Word. I'm going to pray. I'd love for you to be able to pray with me, and then we'll just consider some of what this is saying to us as individuals, but as a church. Lord, I thank you for your Word. Thank you that you speak into our lives with authority, but with grace. You speak truth, but you speak it with love. And so as we consider what this has to say to us as a church, Lord, give us discernment and ears to hear what you are saying. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So what's the deal with deacons is the question I led with. Well, in lots of ways, it's the same considerations that we need to make when we thought about what's the deal with elders? What's God's concern for and what is God's standard for pastors, for elders. And so when we start to think about deacons, we can see specifically from this passage, but there are certainly other examples in the New Testament of deacons at work in the local church, that God still has a great concern for this type of leader in the church, this type of um, person who serves in the church, which is exactly what the word deacon in the original language that the Bible was written in means. It means servant or servant of the church is the context. In lots of ways, a deacon is the same as an elder. There are a couple of key differences though. So I would say that they are the same but different. The passage that we just read from 1 Timothy deals with two different groups of um, officers in some sense, but types of leaders in the local church, elders or pastors and deacons. And in lots of ways, as you read through this list, you probably heard it, there's a lot of overlap. There's a lot the same about these. So the the character qualifications that are true of an elder are also true of a deacon. Those that are called to shepherd the church The list that's there, the type of pastor that God is looking for, easily transfers over and we can see that there's another group of people um, who the same expectations apply. God has the same expectations on those that should be called deacon in the church as those who are called elders in the church or pastors in the church. So they're the same, but I also said they're different. So what's different? I think so because these two lists are so much the same, there is so much overlap, we should look carefully to see, well, what are the differences between the two lists that we see in verses 1 through 7 and then 8 through 13? What are the things that stand out as being either included as something new information or something that's left out? Well, here's the first one that I noticed When we first read about elders and pastors, last week we made quite a um, a big deal. We we talked about it at length that although most of what is required has to do with character, one key skill for a pastor is an aptitude to teach. 
the ability to open up God's Word, to share it with others in such a way that it brings to bear the truth of God's Word into the life of the church, whether that happens behind a pulpit, in front of a camera, or over a kitchen table, it doesn't really matter, but is there an aptitude to teach? Now, as we start to then move into the list of deacons, we start to see that that is missing. All the same character qualifications exist, but what Paul leaves out is an aptitude to teach. It's not expected that everyone is able to teach like an elder or a pastor is given the responsibility to do. But a deacon still serves the church, uh, loves the church, cares for the church in every other way without necessarily the responsibility of being apt to teach. That's one of the key differences. And the other one that I noticed is that Paul makes a specific reference to deacons must first be tested. Now, in some ways, this is a little bit similar to those who are called to be a pastor or an elder. If we look at the eldership list back in verses 1 through 7, uh, Paul says, hey, listen, it's really important that this person who's been considered to be a elder isn't a new Christian. And that's important, he said, because they may become conceited. There, there might be a pride issue that sometimes only becomes uncovered as we've walked the life of a disciple for some years. Um, so in one sense, yes, there's a type of testing that takes place, a testing of time. For elders. But for a deacon, Paul makes a very specific um, reference to the fact that, hey, we need to test these people first. And if they can serve the church with um, a sense of integrity, then, then they can serve as deacons. Now, what that test was, I'm pretty certain it wasn't an exam, pretty certain it wasn't an assessment in that sense. Um, I don't think they sort of sat down in a room and, you know, do you know John 3.16? Yes, okay, that's very good. I think this is actually about living life in community, visible before everybody else, with a sense of developed reputation over time as well. I think there's a very specific way that deacons can serve, and because of the nature of what they can do, we'll get to that shortly, there needs to be a level of integrity and trust that not only the elders have, but the entire church has. And so that's one of the differences, is a very key reference to the fact that these people must be tested. The third thing that I want to make mention of is the fact that in the original language, this is more obvious than it is in English, I, I grant that. But the language that Paul uses in the two different lists is quite different when it comes to the gender. So in the list of elder or pastor, all the language that Paul uses to describe them is given in the masculine sense, for men. Yet when he moves over to the list of deacons, that language changes. He interchanges language which can mean man, specifically, masculine. Sometimes he uses the word in its feminine sense, the feminine, and sometimes he uses a generic word which can be interpreted male or female. So we understand that in Raymond Terrace Community Church as meaning that those who serve as a deacon in the church may be either male or female, both are necess necessary, both are required, both are able to serve in the way that God has gifted them to serve. Sometimes our translations, depending on the English translation that you're using, it may not be as clear. Hopefully, if you have a, a reasonable translation, it should put a footnote down the bottom of the page. There should be an asterisk or a little number one or something beside um, wives likewise in that passage, where it could mean, it simply means women, um, and it should be there in your footnote. The translation offers both of those. And so we would see that it doesn't necessarily mean that deacons have a list of rules and deacons' wives have a list of rules, except that it would say that both men and women may serve in this role and both are important, that their character and what they are able to serve with, um, it matters. It matters from a level of character, of integrity and how they serve. 
So elders and deacons, they're the same in some senses, but different. The key difference being elders have a responsibility before the Lord to have an aptitude, an ability to teach. Deacons serve in a similar way to shepherds in caring for the church, caring for their needs, caring for one another without the responsibility to teach and can be either male or female. I want to go back to an early case study that we have in the New Testament itself to see how this started to work out. So if you have your Bibles, why don't you turn back to Acts chapter 6. Um, there's a really key event in the life of the early church. It's much earlier than when Paul wrote his letter to Timothy or Peter wrote his letter to the churches. Um, very early in the life of the church, as Jesus um, had been to the cross Uh, risen from the dead, ascended back to the Father. At Pentecost, the Spirit came, and we know that as Peter and others preached boldly in Jerusalem, that thousands upon thousands in the very early weeks following Jesus' ascension to the Father came to faith. And all of a sudden, a very small group of disciples exploded into being quite a large group of disciples, all centered in the city of Jerusalem primarily. Now, we also know that at Pentecost, when Peter was preaching, remember, it said that there were Jews scattered from all over the Roman Empire who were in Jerusalem and celebrating. We also know that there were a number of other nationalities and ethnic groups who were present. And it would seem that very early in the peace, there were Jewish ethnic believers and there were Greeks, Greek-speaking or Gentile Believers And both of these groups of people who normally didn't have anything to do with each other had now found their unity in the gospel and they were one in Christ. Paul would later on write extensively about how that works. But it's important for us to know that this is the dynamic of the early church. There were Jewish believers, there were Gentile believers, and yet they were worshipping Jesus together. Now, Acts chapter 6, verses 1 through 7. Let me read it to you. In those days, as the disciples were increasing in number, there arose a complaint by the Hellenistic Jews. That's the the Greek-speaking or the Gentile-speaking, the Greek-speaking Jews against the Hebraic Jews, those that spoke um, Hebrew. So we can see two different groups of people here. Um, some who had come from elsewhere in the world and they spoke Greek and some who spoke Hebrew. They were locals, all right? So these were the Hellenistic Jews against the Hebraic Jews that their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution. The 12, the 12 apostles, summoned the whole company of the disciples and said, It would not be right for us to give up preaching the word of God to wait on tables. Brothers and sisters, select from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the spirit and wisdom, whom we can appoint to this duty. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. The proposal pleased the whole company. So they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit, and Philip, Prochorus, Icana, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas, a convert from Antioch. They had them stand before the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. So the word of God spread. The disciples in Jerusalem increased greatly in number and a large group of priests became obedient to the faith. Let me just summarize that so that we're all clear of what was going on. Um, There was no Centrelink in Jerusalem in the first century. There was no social security provided by either the Roman government or the local Jewish government. If you were a widow, it was expected that your extended family would supply for your needs. Now, it would seem that the church was taking on responsibility for those in their midst who needed additional support. And so these widows 
were being provided for by the gathered church, either in monetary or in goods and services or whatever it might have been, and they were distributing this amongst those in need. Now, here's where a problem occurred. Uh, Already in the first century church, there was ethnic and racial tension taking place. A complaint arose, an argument came up. There was basically a complaint saying, listen, some people are being favoured. Uh, the, uh, the Jewish speaking, the, the Hebraic speaking widows, they seem to be getting more support. And there are Greek speaking or Gentile um, background, they're, they're not getting the same support. This is unfair. Um, now, the the apostles, the, the, those that were in charge of shepherding that very first church, um, they decided, listen, we need to continue to focus on what God's called us to do. We need help. We need other people to come in. We need someone to oversee this ministry, that there is um, fairness. It's, this is not just about waiting on tables. This is not just about who's going to be on our food distribution list. This, this is a key group of people who were called to ensure that there was justice and fairness and equity in our care. That there, we're not overlooking key factors of the gospel that we are one in Christ, even in how we care for one another. And so this group of people were gathered together. And we can see that even as the apostles in the very early part of the church were saying, listen, they need to be people of integrity. They need to be filled with the Spirit. This is not just, do they have the skills necessary to the job? This is not, oh, have they got a background in social issues or in food distribution? That was not part of the equation. The equation was, are these people filled with the love of God for people? Are they able to exercise discernment and judgment well? And they were called to work alongside of the pastors, the elders, in how the church was cared for. The elders had the primary responsibility to care for the church through prayer and the ministry of the word, while deacons had the primary responsibility to care for the church through the practical administration of justice and material needs. But they worked hand in hand, as it were, for the care and good of the church. I think here there's a principle for appointment that we as a church have taken on board not only for deacons in the future, but also for elders. Uh, A key principle for appointment here that I think is important for us to be able to see. Um, You'll notice that there wasn't a vote. It's not like they said, we're going to get together, we're going to have the ballots, everyone, whoever gets the most votes, they're the ones who come in, all right? Um, That didn't happen. It wasn't also primarily the responsibility of the elders, as if the elders can just sort of hand pick who they would like. This was a responsibility for the entire church. And so the first thing I want you to notice is that the church was the one who was asked to look for suitable people. It's not like they were putting forward in a voting system, but they were simply asked to identify, to nominate almost, suitable people who met the qualifications given. And then come back to the apostles. The apostles said, listen, go away and then come back to us. So the church was asked to identify those in their midst who met these qualifications to simply prayerfully bring them before the elders with their recommendation. Or to use different terms, the church commended qualified potential servants to the eldership. The second thing is, the elders listened to the church. They prayed for these leaders and they commissioned them to the role. Now, I'm going to assume that they were in agreement with the church as the church brought back uh, Stephen and they said, listen, we see Stephen or one of the other gentlemen there that had to practice reading their names for. Um, These are the guys that we really see the Spirit at work in and that we think could fulfill this role. And I I would assume that the elders there said, well, we agree. We see that also. And that's a principle that we use here at Raymond Terrace. Um, We usually um, 
appoint pastors or at least preach through a, a series like this, maybe every three years. It's a little bit overdue because of last year, but um, around every three years or so, we, we read through these passages. We remind you as a church what it is that God is looking for in pastors, in elders, and we use this principle. We say, listen, go away and pray, identify, consider, read the scriptures, look for who God is at work in in our church, who is already serving in this way with compassion and discernment, and, and identify them and bring them to us as an eldership. Commend them to us, and we give you an opportunity to do that. We will do the same as we seek to appoint deacons into the future. Now, for quite some time as a church, we haven't had a formal uh, office or formal leadership position called a deacon. Uh, we've had people who did the work and we call them different names over different times. We've had ministry leaders and we've had uh, group leaders and we've had all different names. But, but in a sense, what we'd like to do is say we would love to see serving side by side um, elders and deacons. Not one who does spiritual work and one who just does practical work. That's not the division. Uh, They both care for the church. They just simply care in different ways. Uh, Into the future, we'd like to give you more information about how that might happen, but we would like you to start praying about it. Start looking for those in our church who either serve um, or, or you see serving maybe as an elder or as a pastor in the future. And prayerfully consider it. You don't need to go and talk to them necessarily. Just simply pray before the Lord. And then bring their names to us. Commend them to us. The same for deacons. Who are those that are filled with the Spirit, who work for the Lord, who are able to love the church and and do so in ways that we already see, who are able to, with discernment, bring justice and care to those in our midst and beyond, pray, ask the Lord to to show you. And then if he gives you names of those that you identify, then bring them to us. We would love to hear your commendations for those in our mix who could either serve as an elder or as a deacon in the future. We don't currently have any deacons serving formally, as I said, currently, but that's something that we feel convicted to change. So here's the summary. Jesus is the great shepherd of our church. He's the only one that we should turn to. Whether you are currently serving as an elder or Matt as he rejoins the pastoral team, this is something that we all must do. Elders, shepherds, overseers, deacons, whether you've been here 30 years as a member of this church or whether you've been here three days or whether you've been just tuning into us in the last couple of weeks and interested in knowing more about our church, I want you to know that the only place that we must turn to as a church is to look to the great shepherd. We will be lost apart from him. Secondly, Jesus himself, the great shepherd, has appointed under shepherds, men who pastor the church, not on their own authority in any way, but only in the authority given to them by the Word of God. These men lead the church primarily through prayer and the ministry of the Word, exercising humble oversight and care for God's flock. That is God's design and standard for us as a church. But thirdly, pastors and deacons are designed to serve side by side. There have been many, many nights as an eldership and as a pastoral team that we have gathered together praying for, seeing very real needs, but also feeling so stretched and actually saying, I wish, I wish we had beside us some faithful men and women that we can, we can give this responsibility to. And we've sought to do that in the ways that we can, but we know that we will be able to serve better in the way that God has designed us to serve if we can serve side by side, in unison with a team of deacons. They are the same, but different in their spirit-filled leadership of the church. With deacons taking the lead in the wise administration of justice and our resources and the practical needs and how we care for one another. So 
I would invite you to pray with us as an eldership, as a pastoral team, as we pray that the Lord would make this clear. So pray with us and consider those that are serving amongst us who might be able to serve in this role as deacon. I would ask you maybe, why don't you take the month of September, the the month that we're about to enter into, why don't you commit the month of September to praying regularly, whether that's a reminder on your phone each day or, or a certain frequency throughout the week, to stop and pray, not only for us as a pastoral team, we, we covet your prayers, but, but in particular, that God would raise up another generation of leaders, both to join us in the role as shepherd and pastor and elder and to serve as deacons as this church moves forward into very unusual and unknown times ahead. Will you pray through the month of September? We will be. I would love it if you could join us. If the Lord gives you names and and thoughts and considerations, please commend them to us. Uh, contact us as a pastoral team and say, listen, as I've been praying, the Lord has laid on my heart um, these names, these people. We would love to hear from you. I'm going to pray now. Uh, Thank you for this time that we've shared over the last few weeks. Um, Thank you for those who have served here um, in ways, setting up things behind the scenes that you don't get to see that cause innumerable headaches. (laughs) Um, we We need hearts and people who love to serve the church in whatever ability and gifts and the way that God has designed them to pray. So let's let's pray together. Lord, thank you for our time together as a church, even if it's through means of a live stream, as we've considered your word, as we've lifted our eyes to the great shepherd and seen Jesus, the one who calls us by name, the one who leaves the 99 to chase after the one who wanders, the one who stands as the gate, our defender, the one to we look to. Lord, thank you that you shepherd us so well. And Lord, for the under-shepherds of this church, you've called these men to work together with their gifts in caring for your flock, not ours. And as we pray and work in the word and minister amongst the church Lord I pray that you would give us discernment beyond our fallible way of thinking fill us with the spirit to do this for your glory and Lord for those that you are calling to serve this church in a role as a deacon those who can exercise judgment and discernment and care for the flock Lord will you give us eyes to see impress on our hearts those that you're calling into this role Lord, thank you that you instruct us through your word. Help us to be obedient to it, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.